today what I want to do is show you how to get up on top of your financial house and want you to get up on top of your financial house and be standing up there. It's going to take you a few years. It's not going to be quick. If you're looking for get rich quick, you're in the wrong room. And how do you get up on top of the house? In Tennessee, if we want to get up on top of the house, we use this thing called a ladder. And ladders have steps and they have rules about the steps. If you get up the ladder and it starts moving, if you're over 16, you come back down and you steady the ladder and you do it again. You repeat the steps, but you take the steps slow and gradual. You don't skip steps because otherwise you'll be hanging upside down with your leg broke and your neighbor will be laughing at you. No step skipping. Be willing to come back down to solid ground and repeat the process. These are the rules of using a ladder around our place. We call these ladders. These steps, baby steps, and you don't do baby step four until you've done baby step one. There's a process here, and there's a reason because you have to lay a solid foundation. If you're going to build a house, you don't bring the trim carpenter in and start attacking up the crown mold if you hadn't done the drywall and built the house on top of the foundation. You start with a foundation, and you build up from there. Baby step one, we're going to start with before we do anything else, like a thousand dollars baby starter emergency fund. It's only a thousand dollars, and I want you to get a thousand dollars as fast as you possibly can to start that. So that's not your emergency fund. That's your starter emergency fund. You know, I want you to get 10 Benjamin Franklins, baby. Right quick, right now, fast. This is the easiest baby step because it's only a thousand dollars. It's the one you'll do the fastest in most cases. This is the hardest baby step because this is the point you decide. You decide, am I really going to change my life? Am I really going to buy into this stuff? Am I really going to do something that other people are doing? Am I really going to engage this process? Or am I going to keep doing it, slopping it up the way I've been doing it? I'm going to get serious. I'm going to get focused. This thing is going to change because, you know, here's the problem. We don't like change. Human beings don't like change. We tend to do the same thing over and over and over again. Some people work in a job that they've been with 15 years and they hate every day of it. And the only reason they don't change is because they don't like change. Even if we're doing things and they're not working for us, we defend it. We protect and fight for our right to be stupid. We get stuck in our stuff, don't we? We're like a toddler sitting in a poopy diaper. We know it smells bad, but it's warm in its mind. We don't like change. Let me tell you, if you're going to win in this life, you have to learn to embrace change. Because the only thing that never changes is we're going to change. Change is a way of life. Embrace it. And you've got to embrace it with changing and doing some new stuff with your money. You know, start with $1,000 in the bank. You've got to learn to save money because nobody does it. Everybody talks about it. Everybody looks and goes and nobody does it. You're walking around with no money. The richest country the world has ever known. And all the money leaves your house every month. You have to make this a philosophical process a theological process, a spiritual and emotional or relational and a mathematical process. I'm saving money. I'm sick of being broke. I've been doing budgets for 20 years. I do know about it. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. So it's being broke. So what we're starting here is the first step of savings is the emergency fund. Grandma said to save for a rainy day. 78 of Americans according to Money Magazine, are going to have a major negative financial event. In any given 10-year period of time, you better be ready. It's coming. You need to be ready. You need to save money for emergencies. You're an emergency looking for a place to happen. If you haven't been kicked in the knee to the tune of five to $7,000 in the last three or four years, you're overdue. Statistically, it's coming. Get ready. You need to build your emergency fund. You need to be positive. I'm positive. It's going to rain. Get you an emergency fund. That's how this stuff works. This $1,000. You don't even have to put this in the bank. You could just do like one lady did. She went down to Walmart and bought an 8 by 10 picture frame and put it in there and framed it and wrote under this, in case of emergency, break glass. You don't want to keep it in the underwear drawer because the pizza man will get it. You got to keep it where you can't get to it too easy but where you can get to it if you need it. You get $1,000 set aside. Get that minimum, baby step, that beginner starter emergency fund ready to go. Personal finances, 80 behavior. It's only 20 head knowledge. You've got to change what you're doing in order to get a different result. 
you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. The 12-steppers call that the definition of insanity. Baby step two, the debt snowball, pay off all of your debt using the debt snowball except your home. We're gonna list our debts, smallest to largest. We're gonna pay minimum payments on everything but the little one, and we're gonna attack the little one with a vengeance. When the payment is gone, there we're gonna take that payment and any other money we can squeeze out of our budget in our life, and we're gonna attack number two. When number two is gone, we're gonna take the payments from one and two and everything we can squeeze out of our life. We're gonna attack number three. And every time that snowball rolls over, it picks up more snow to where by the time you get to your largest debt, except your home, which is typically a student loan or a car payment, isn't it? When you get to that student loan or car payment, the average family in America is paying between $1,500 to $2,000 a month in payments not associated with their home, non-mortgage payments. When you start paying $1,500 or $2,000 a month on a $10,000 car loan or a student loan, that sucker's gone in just a few months. You get the idea, we pay this off smallest to largest. Well, would it not be mathematically proper to pay off the highest interest rate first? Yes, it would. If we were doing math, we wouldn't have credit card debt. This is about behavior modification. When you go on a diet, it's a good idea to lose weight the first week. That way you will keep doing it because it's too much work to not eat into exercise. It makes you grouchy. It does me anyway. No, you too. You see, okay, so you know the deal is this. I got to see some results from my pain, you with me. And when I can knock off that little one and knock off that next one and knock off that next one, I'm getting that pump up thing going, going. This is doable. My belief kicks in. My faith is built. My hope grows. And I get more and more and more and more intense as I go down the thing. That intensity, that focus causes this to happen. And I notice that intensity and that focus and, and the intimacy of talk radio as people are calling in, I got to where after years of doing this, I can kind of tell if they're going to be able to do it. I can hear it in their voice. I can hear it in the cadence of their speech and the words that they're using. Not can discern what's happening. Not every time, but I started noticing that I can tell. That one's going to make it. That one's not because they'll call up and go like, ah, I'm getting out of that. It's not that extreme, but sometimes it is but you get this thing coming up out of them. You can feel it. I've had Lise Brown, the great motivator says, people change their lives when they have finally say, I've had it. I've had a moment where I say, I've had it. I'm sick of this. That's when you change your life. You gotta get to that point. You can wander into debt, but you can't wander out. You gotta have this moment where you say, that's it, I'm tired of working my butt off and I don't have anything to show for it, but an empty payment book. That's how this works. But I promise you it works, baby. If you keep doing it, you get to chase the cheetah. So now we don't have any payments, but a house payment. We're at baby step two. We're 18 to 24 months ends that feel pretty good. Now our next goal is we're totally with gazelle intensity, going to continue to focus with focus intensity. We're gonna build up that $1,000 account until it reaches a fully funded emergency fund, which is three to six months of expenses. Emergency funds should be easy to access or liquid. Put them in a money market type account with your mutual fund company, check writing privileges. It's not going to earn much interest. And I want you to put three to six months of expenses. Some of you, that'll be 10, 15, even $20,000. Just sitting there boring, but ready for life to happen. See, here's the deal, your emergency fund, the problem we get is we get mixed up about it. It is not an investment. Your emergency fund is insurance. Here's the difference. Investments are money that make you money. Insurance costs you money to protect your money that is making you money. You buy insurance to protect your house, to protect your health. You buy insurance to replace your life and the money you make if something happens to you. Call life insurance. Insurance is an expense that protects assets. Your emergency fund is not an asset. It technically is in accounting terms, but you don't need to look at it that way. In other words, if it earns a little interest, that's just good. But it's not there to earn interest. It's there to protect your 401k. Because if you have to dip into your 401k because you didn't have an emergency fund and the government takes half of it in penalties and taxes, that's what's known as stupid. Because you didn't have an emergency fund. I never had an emergency fund any time in my life when I was a millionaire doing the real estate stuff. He didn't have any money saved. 
everything went back into the deal. Everything we spent, everything we consumed, no money, no liquidity, no cash. And that's one of the reasons I went down because I had no wiggle room. And that's what this is. It puts a pad between you and Murphy. You know Murphy as if it can go wrong. It will. And let me tell you what, you don't have an emergency fund. Murphy will move in your spare bedroom and bring his three cousins broke, desperate and stupid, and your life will look like a country song. That's how this deal happens. So you don't put it in the CD, a certificate of depression, because if you cash that out early, they charge you a penalty. That's not liquid. That's not easy to access. So a simple money market account with something like your mutual fund company, and you put three to six months of expenses in there. Money market accounts are easily accessible. Men say things about the emergency fund like it's boring. It's not sophisticated enough. You only take 20,000 bucks and let's sit there and make only three or 4%. I could do a lot better with that. I could do a BBD, a bigger, better deal. I got this game plan. I got this shot. Get this. My wife says I'm scheming and scamming when I do that kind of stuff. And guys are always trying to do this. Very few women do this stuff. See, women, on the other hand, say things like it's the most important key to our financial plan. Guys, if you want to make one of the best investments you'll ever make in your life, She's wired by God naturally to be smarter than you on this subject. Her nature takes her to the place to be calm and secure in this area. This emergency fund causes her to relax in a place you don't even have when you do the investment and the work and the budgeting to participate in the process. And this emergency fund is put in place. She'll relax and she'll look at you through a different set of eyes. This is one of two things. I'm going to tell you today, for those of you that are married or ever want to be married, that will revolutionize your marriage because she will feel completely different at that point. Not because she's weaker, because on money things, a lot of times ladies are actually stronger, but because on this subject, that's how she's wired. And she'll look at you in a different way when that emergency fund's in place. It's an investment in your marriage. An emergency fund turns a crisis into an inconvenience. If your transmission goes out, it's $2,700 to fix it. You have $15,000. You go, dad gum, transmission went out. That's a pain. Transmission goes out and you're broke. You go, oh God, the world's coming to my head. It changes your whole life. The drama starts to leave your life when you have this emergency fund stuff in place. It is absolutely powerful. That is baby step three. And now the baby steps take a different flavor. Four, five, and six, we're going to do it at the same time. And so we're going to limit our investing here in four to only 15% because I want to work on the other two baby steps at the same time. Instead of going 22 or 28 in savings, only 15 invested into Roth arrays and 400 one S. This is a mathematical explosion. That stuff we talked about where there's interest on the interest on the interest. Now you got a different kind of ball snowball rolling. It's rolling down the hill and you're chasing it instead of it chasing you. Now you get to see wealth start to build. Your money starts to make you money. This is a plan right here. $100 a month invested from age 25 to age 65. At 12 and a decent growth stock mutual fund is $1,176,000. I just gave you a formula to be a millionaire straight up. 30 to 70 is the same numbers. 35 to 75 is the same numbers. $100 a month, that's pizza money in some of your houses. It's your cable bill. You know what I'm saying? You know, you consume $100 in lighty them. And now he's getting personal and they're having like a withdrawal back there. Caffeine thing happening, a hundred bucks, a hundred dollars, and you're a millionaire every single month. Roth IRAs and 400 ones are secret government formulas to wealth. Now you don't have any payments, but a house payment. Now you can find 500 bucks. Let's do the numbers. Average household income is $40,816. That's $33 other $3 a month. That's what it is. You take home pay is about $2,700. Bucks. The average family making 40 has got a house payment of about $700. $2,700 take home minus a house. Payment of $700 leaves $2,000. Bucks. Yeah, $2,000 bucks to eat pay lights. Oh, I don't have any debt payments. Maybe I could save 500 out of the 2000. Could I? Yes. And then you might end up with some money in the process. This is real. I didn't just make this up today. We've, we've done this for a long time and it works. 
And see, here's what's interesting about those numbers. The raw theory grows tax-free because it doesn't happen very often. This is Washington and they're a freaking parasite. So tax-free is a good idea. It's very unusual. Now let's think about it. $6,000 a year for 40 years. What's six times four? 24. That's $240,000 that went in. This is interesting. $240,000 went in and it grew $5.8 million. So out of $5,800,000, $5,600,000 of it you didn't put in. Wow, it's all growth. The whole thing is growth. It's the no-ball adding snow. And the fact that it's tax-free is huge because taxes on $6 million would look a lot like a million six hundred thousand dollars which means this word Roth, is worth in this example somewhere around $400,000 a letter. The 400 wet is a secret government formula to wealth because you do that investing pre-tax. If you take $1,000 of your income and bring it home, by the time it gets home, it looks suspiciously like 700. But if you put it in pre-tax, the whole 700 plus your 300, you would have given to Congress goes in. Why is that important? Because 240,000 turns into 5.8 million. So we want as many of these government dollars as we can gather up. That would have gone to them earlier. We use them. They do a lot of heavy lifting. So every one of them are multiplied bazillions of times over. So every dollar I can keep in my hand to grow money with, with pre-tax investing is genius. But the trick is, you need to start right now. Ben and Arthur illustrate that fact for us. Ben invests starting at age 19. He invests 2000 a year in a good growth stock mutual fund all the way up until age 26. Ben puts in 16000 for eight years, 2000 a year. That's 16000 at age 27. He quit investing. It's not a trick question. And the money grows and the money grows. His brother Arthur wakes up and says, whoa, I've been dumb. I need to catch up. I'm going to start investing $2,000. He starts at age 27 and invests $2,000 a year from age 27 all the way to age 65. He puts 78,000 in and then he never catches up. The guy who put in 16,000 beats the guy who put in 78,000 by $1,000. Some of you are going, that's a real neat chart if I was 19. You understand. If you gather this information, you put it in your brain and it changes your heart and causes you to handle money differently the rest of your life. This one section right here, this one chart will make you a multimillionaire. I just made you a millionaire if you got this. Now, let me just tell you some people say, am I too old to shave money? Not if you're still sucking win. Besides that, you can't go backwards. This is your only option. You can start where you are and let's go. I'm 52. It's too late, so shoot yourself. I mean, what are you gonna do? Let's go from here. Let's go from here. We got to go somewhere with this. I know people make the most money they were made in their lives in their 50s. Lots of people never do anything until they're 60. Colonel Sanders never fried chicken commercially until he was 67 years old. Grandma Moses never painted a painting until she was 84 years old. She did 1,500 works of art, 450 of them she did after age 100. Everything you know, Winston Churchill for. He did in his 70s. Everything you know, Golda Meir for, she did in her 70s. It's not over till you quit. But with the money thing, it's easier if you start now. And now we only put 15% of our income into retirement at baby step four, because I wanted to save some money to start working on the kids college fund. If you have kids and you want to do a kids college fund, baby step five is where you do it. You don't do the kids college fund while you're still in debt because you don't have any money. It's all going to payments. You don't use the emergency fund to send the kids to college. That's not an emergency. And by the way, when they go to college, they could learn to do something like work. It won't kill them. College funding, make sure the kids are fit too. An educational savings account. The education IRA is what it's nicknamed as. It's the ESA. is like the Roth IRA for college. It grows tax-free. You're allowed to put $2,000 a year into this account. You put $2,000 a year into it. It will grow tax-free from zero to 18. Two times 18 is $36,000 went in. $36,000 went in, but you'll have about $126,000 in there, 12% when they reach 18. And that means you have somewhere around $90,000 in growth that you pay no taxes on. So do this for your kid's college, the educational savings account, and good growth stock mutual funds. Take the time to research the cost of college.
You need to think about that when they're little. You need to think about that as they get older. Some of you have kids that are 13, 14 years old right now. You haven't started saving for college. And so you're not going to have enough to pay cash for college. You don't have enough to pay cash for some big expensive private school unless you put them deeply in debt instead. You could do something like send them to a school you could afford. Oh, there's a thought. But see, we go crazy with the word education. We worship at the altar of the diploma in this culture. And let me tell you what your, your college degree is worth. Nothing, the knowledge that you got on the way to getting that degree, if it is applied in the marketplace, is the only thing that has value. Knowledge is the currency of this millennium. Knowledge is important. Continual learning is important. It's not over when you leave college. You need to read and do some other things continually to get better like you're doing in here today. Continual learning is the only way you're going to win. Teach your kids that. And think about what you're getting for what you're spending. I'm happy for you if you graduated from Horton or Harvard or Yale. I am not putting those schools down. I'm not putting down Vanderbilt. But let me tell you what. If you're going to go there, you better be ready to pay for it. And if you're telling me it's worth going $100,000 in debt to there, I can economically prove to you, you're an idiot. The average college student is graduating right now with $27,900 in student loan debt. This is crazy. And another $6,000 in credit card debt. By the way, first rule, college pay cash. Now we're sailing. We've got the retirement going. We got the emergency fund in place. We're doing the kids' college into the educational savings account. Now, every other dollar above that that we get coming in, put it on the house. Pay off the house. Pay off the house. Pay off the house. Pay off the house. Think about it. What could you do if you had no payments? I mean, if you just take a house payment, put that puppy into a mutual fund every month. You know how quick that's a million dollars? Really quick? You've been looking at these numbers all day long. You're beginning to see how this stuff works. I mean, what could you do if you had no payments you'd have control of your most powerful wealth building tool, which is your income. That's the muscle of your ability to build things. Be wise to keep my home mortgage because I get the tax deduction. How many have you ever heard the tax deduction myth? I don't want to pay off my house. I'll lose my only tax deduction. That's one of the biggest ones. And I'm amazed that CPAs are so stupid and they do this. Really, I've got a degree in finance. Now take a tax deduction if you have one, for goodness sakes. Don't send too much money to Washington, but staying in debt because of a tax deduction. Here's how that works. Think about it for a second. If you had a $100,000 mortgage at a 5% interest, that means the interest that you paid that year would be 5% of $200,000, which is $10,000. Now, if you do that and you make $70,000 a year, and you have a $10,000 tax deduction, and you have make 70, you don't pay taxes on 70. If you have a $10,000 tax deduction, you pay taxes on 60. If that's the case, you're in a 25% tax bracket. You save 2,500 in taxes. A tax deduction mathematically is sending the mortgage company 10,000 to save sending a taxes of 2,500 to Washington. Here's an idea, pay off your mortgage, give your church 10,000, and you get the exact same benefit. It's wise to borrow all I can in my home because I can invest it and make more on the investment. If I borrow money at 6.5% and I put it in a good mutual fund making 12, am I not making a 5.5% spread? The answer is no, because your little formula is naive out here in the real world where we all live. If, if you make 12, you're going to pay taxes on it and your after-tax yield is 9.4. And out here in the real world, if you're smart, you don't compare zero risk investments apples to apples with risky investments. My I got a 30-year mortgage, and I promise to pay it like a 15. You're lying to yourself. The truth is no one does. Something will go wrong. It will rain every month. You know the interesting thing about a 15-year mortgage? They pay off in 15 years or less every time. You know how many times a 30-year mortgage pays off in 15 years or less unless it's refinanced? 2% of them pay off systematically in 15. Nobody does this stuff. Everybody talks about it and thinks, well, if I have a little problem, I'll have wiggle room that way. Well, your life is a little problem. That's what happens. And 15-year mortgages pay off in 15 years. So here's the deal with the house, only buy a home after baby step three. You're debt-free. You have the emergency fund. I recommend paying cash. You're crazy. 
it's hard. I don't borrow money. There is nothing on the planet. I don't bad enough to go back into debt ever. The borrower is slave to the lender. I got that, okay? I got it all the way to the soles of my feet. I don't even want to have anything to do with a bank unless I'm buying it. That's simple. But if you're going to go get a house, never take out more than a 15-year mortgage and never take out more than a 15-year mortgage where your payment on a fixed rate is more than a fourth of your take-home pay. You're buying too much house. And if some rip-off loan shark, subprime greedy banker is going to stick you with a prepayment penalty with an adjustable rate mortgage, with an interest-only mortgage, with a balloon payment, with an above-market interest rate, just because if I get a house, my life will be good. Back off. You're not ready to buy yet. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How are we transformed? By the renewing of our minds. Transformed. Have a total money makeover. People don't get the best use of their money and have to have money problems for two basic reasons. Number one is ignorance. Don't get mad at me. You know, I'm ignorant about some things you don't want to do in brain surgery on you or fixing your car. In either case, there'll be parts left over. Ignorance is not a lack of intelligence. Ignorance is like a know-how. I don't know how to do those things. I'm an intelligent guy, but I don't know how to do those things. You can do that. We can hire people to do brain surgery. You can hire them to work on your car. And I highly recommend it in both cases. But don't hire them to manage your money. You need to learn how to do this stuff. You can bring CPAs in to teach you. You can bring in an investment guy in the mutual funds to help you. A real estate gal over here. A good mortgage broker over here. It's Aaron's person to teach you, but they all need to have the heart of a teacher because all you're looking for is counsel. You're not looking for a babysitter. You're not looking for a daddy or a mommy because it's your job to manage your life. And the multitude of counselors, there's safety. You gather the information, but you make your decisions. Don't let someone else do that for you. Now we got the house paid off. Now the kid's college is underway. Now retirement's underway. See, when you get all that done, baby step seven, there's nothing left to do except build lots of wealth and give it away. You're going to have the most fun you've ever had with money when you hit baby step seven. When you launch into this area of wealth, you're going to look at things through a completely different lens that you didn't even know you had in your camera. It's a whole new way of seeing things. Your most powerful wealth building tool is your income. When you get control of that, it will launch you. And you don't have to be on the radio, and you don't have to have best-selling books to do it. Regular people making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year do this stuff all the time. Wealth is not an escape mechanism; it is instead of tremendous responsibility. If you think your life's going to get better just because you get money, you're wrong. Because you become more of what you are. If you are a jerk and you get a bunch of money, you will become a very large jerk. If you're generous and charitable and you get money you will have a huge impact on people around you. You'll never sit down in church next to a single mom who's crying because their light bill was paid, but what you just reach over and pay it to the end of the year, but you really don't do it right then. You do it after you get home. So she doesn't know who did it because it was really God that did it. It wasn't you. You don't need to be taking the credit anyway. There's only three things you can do with money. You can have fun with it. You can invest it and you can give it. And you need to do all three. You better be having some fun. Money's fun if you got some. You need to be investing it so you got some. And you need to be giving it because it is the most fun you'll ever have with it. Giving is possibly the most fun you'll ever have with money. That's the deal. You know, Winston Churchill said, he said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Andrew Carnegie, who was the Bill Gates of his day, in the year 1900, Carnegie Steel. Carnegie Hall, and started most of the public libraries in America today. The wealthiest guy of the year, 1900, used to say that surplus wealth is a sacred trust to be managed for the good of others. If you'll bear with me for about two minutes and not move, this last section is very, very important. There's two things I want to cover with you. One is this. Each of you are perfectly trained, perfectly designed four-cylinder engines. You need to run on all four cylinders to be able to win. We're physical beings. Take care of this, you get one. Don't go to McDonald's, eat 62 Big Macs and go, they're blessed for the nourishment of our bodies. Take care of this, you got one. Eat less, exercise more, it's not hard. Just be cognizant of what you're putting in your mouth. People don't sneak in your bedroom in the middle of the night, stuff food down your mouth, it's you. 
You're the one doing it. You know, I know because I put the sign on my desk. It's the food. Stupid. I know it's me. It's my job to take care of me. The second thing is we're emotional beings. If you had something bad happen to you in your life, and most of us that are breathing have, you may need to sit down with your pastor or with a good counselor and unpack your baggage. Life's too short to go through it with a Samsonite. It's heavy. Scary, I came from a dysfunctional family. We all did. They have people in them. I'm not poking fun at you. I'm just saying I know what it means to hurt. And it's okay to get some help when you're hurting. It's kind of dumb not to. The third thing is this. We're intellectual beings. Feed your mind. Read, read, read. Read, 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 read. Read, read. The average person hasn't read a nonfiction book. 70% of Americans haven't read a nonfiction book since their last day of formal education. Charlie Tremendous Jones says that five years from today, you will be the same person. You are today making the same money you have today with the same problems you have today, except for the books you read and the people you meet. Now you can be an intellectual. You can feed your intellect and grow. You can take care of your body and you can take care of your emotions. But if you do those three out of four, you are not running on three quarter or 75% power until you plug in the fourth one. The other three don't work right. And when you plug it in, it takes you to more than 100 power. It takes you to 110 power. It kicks in the joy. It kicks in the celebration of life. It kicks in the passion of life. It increases your, your creativity. It changes everything about the other three. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the spiritual. The step-by-step -step baby steps program is steeped in common sense biblical wisdom. It is an absolute process that is proven. Literally to date, million within a sea. And Americans are somewhere in those baby steps. They're right now working this exact process. Millions and tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars of debt has already been paid off. Whether this stuff works is not in question. The only question that remains this evening is what you're going to do. Don't wake up five years from now and wish you changed your life. Go home this week and start. Do it right now. It's as you will it. Thank you, Dallas. You're awesome.